Your Excellency, Governor Van Chu, Mr. Vice Chancellor, Professor Kamat, Professor Bhatt, the faculty and students of Goa University, and ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by saying that I do regard it indeed as an extremely great honor to have been uh, invited uh, to take up this visiting chair at Goa University, named, particularly named, after Professor Didi Kosambi. His work on early history has been much admired all over the world, and for me at least, he was one of my earliest mentors from the days when I first started working uh, on early Indian history. I never had a formal position working with him or anything. Uh, our interaction consisted of the best kind of interaction, which was casual chatting about the problems that I was constantly coming up with and which he would occasionally have the patience to discuss with me. I think that the uh, creation of these chairs is really in many ways a fantastic idea. Fantastic because the Goa University is the only university in this country that has these chairs. And uh, the reason why I accepted immediately the moment Mrs. Kuto rang me up um, uh, was because I thought it was really a most unusual thing for a university to do. Knowledge advances through the asking of new questions and seeking fresh answers, working through different frameworks from the earlier ones and thus shifting what he calls the paradigm. 
Further, that this is not the isolated activity of individual scientists. It's also influenced by the intellectual world of the particular scientist. And I would like to say that this applies not only to science, it applies to all branches of knowledge. Let's look for a moment at the intellectual world of Didi Kosambi. We are all familiar with this world. There was his father's interest, really quite a remarkable interest, in Pali texts and Buddhism, where he walked the entire countryside of India in search of a Pali teacher. And his own, Didi Kosambi's own years in Harvard his pursuit of theoretical problems in mathematics, and his discovery of Marxism as a way of analyzing the past and the present. And the way he links the past and the present is something that we all need to think about very carefully. We should perhaps also keep in mind that these decades of the 1940s and 50s, when he was doing the maximum amount of his writing, were the time when scientists were discussing the question of whether the sciences and the humanities constituted two distinctive cultures or were two sides of the same culture. Kosambi's work shows an immense integration of both, and this is reflected in his contribution to both mathematics and history. Let me now turn to the question of the paradigm shift and how he asked questions and suggested answers that changed the way in which we began to pursue our study of early history. The use of a method derived from Marxist thinking did enable him to ask new questions of his data. Nevertheless, there was a broader process involved in his historical thinking, and this enriched his search for fresh answers. His reading was extraordinarily wide and he had a remarkably impressive intellectual reach. It's the kind of reach that many of us would give our left hands for, if not our right hands. This enabled him to go beyond the way in which early history had been interpreted in the past. In order to understand the change, I would like to begin with describing the earlier interpretation of ancient history, and then refer to the changes that were introduced in the last few decades, which many of which changes reflect Kosambi's ideas. At the time of Indian independence, 60 years ago, we had inherited a history of the subcontinent contoured by two substantial views of the past the colonial and the nationalist. Both were primarily concerned with chronology and with sequential narratives. The focus was on those in power, a focus that has been basic to much historical writing of the period up to that time. There was information on the action of kings and dynasties, on governors general and viceroys, and on various national leaders. On most of these, there was broad agreement. What was contested, although only partially, was the colonial representation of early Indian society. The colonial view drew on European preconceptions of Indian history. The use of history to legitimize power had changed since power now lay not in the rule of dynasties, but in colonial and nationalistic definitions of power. As far as colonial scholarship was concerned, there were three arguments that were foundational to that view. The first was that Indian history was divided into three periods, three divisions for convenience sake. 
the Hindu and the subsequent Muslim civilization, and then the British period as formulated in these three divisions by James Mill in his History of British India, published in about 1818. These labels were taken from the religions of the ruling dynasties, first the Hindu and then the Muslim. The divisions were endorsed by the assumption that the units of Indian society have always been monolithic religious communities, primarily the Hindu and the Muslim, and that these communities were mutually hostile right through history. These identities, these identities of the religious community were said to have superseded all other identities. This periodization of Hindu, Muslim, and British colored the understanding of Indian history and had a major role to play in the partition of India in 1947, justifying the two-nation theory. The second assumption in colonial scholarship was that the pre-colonial political economy through the centuries conformed to the model of what was called Oriental despotism. This assumed a static society, completely unchanging through the centuries, characterized by an absence of private property in land, despotic and oppressive rulers, and therefore endemic poverty. A static society meant that it lacked a sense of history, since history records change. Historical writing is all about how things have changed. And consequently, it was said that there was no historical writing in pre-modern India. Indian history, therefore, needed to be discovered by colonial scholars. In other words, it needed to be written in accordance with colonial policy. The third argument was that Hindu society has always been divided into four main castes, the Varnas. These were rigidly separated because they represented the diverse races of the subcontinent. The identification of caste with race resulted from current European ideas of the late 19th century, uh, where there was this theory of race science and the labeling of people by race labels. This caste organization of society was said to be rooted in what was seen as the Aryan foundations of Indian civilizations, uh, civilization, uh, foundations that had been established according to them by something called the Aryan race. Above all, the attempt was to project India as culturally alien, the other of Europe. It was also claimed that these colonial interpretations were applying the criteria of enlightenment rationality in their histories of the colony. But in effect, they were imposing a history that suited the requirements of colonial dominance. These preconceptions, together with a focus on chronology and the narrative of dynasties, governed routine history. Colonial historians drew on texts reflecting the upper caste perspectives of Indian society. And many Indian historians coming from the newly emerged middle class were of the upper castes and familiar with these texts but by and large, they continued the same routine. The periodization given by the British was generally accepted, as it still is at the popular level. You still hear of people talking about the Hindu period and the Muslim period, whereas historians have given up this periodization. Some altered the nomenclature from Hindu, Muslim, and British to ancient, medieval, and modern borrowed from Europe and thought to be more secular, although the markers of change remained the same. 
In effect, therefore, there was very little change. The more nationalist Indian historians naturally rejected the theory of Oriental despotism as a system of political economy. Curiously, however, there was very little interest in providing alternative hypotheses about the early Indian economy and society. This interest began to develop relatively late, in fact, not till about the 1970s. Social history in standard works largely repeated the description of the forecasts as given in the normative texts, the ancient Dharma Shastras. There was little recognition of how the system actually worked with its many deviations from the norm. The predominant form of nationalism described as anti-colonial and secular was beginning to be imprinted on Indian historical writing from the late 19th century. In opposing some aspects of colonial scholarship, it gave rise to a school of nationalist historians. But parallel to this, and initially less apparent in historical writing, were two ideologies that claimed to be representing the Hindus and the Muslims through two religious nationalisms. Both had been deeply influenced by the colonial projection of monolithic and segregated communities of Hindus and Muslims in the Indian past. Such nationalisms were not essentially anti-colonial and were more interested in using history to legitimize their own political ideology of religion-based nationalism and to thus endorse the political mobilization that they sought. And remember, of course, history is extremely central to nationalist ideology. And this is part of the reason why in a post-nationalist phase, many of the major controversies are controversies over history, because it is history that gives legitimacy to certain kinds of nationalism. Muslim religious nationalism defined the identity of Pakistan. Hindu religious nationalism is still seeking a parallel identity for India. The agenda and aspirations of colonial policy were and are apparent in these views. But other writing pointed to the need to examine history in terms of a substantially different set of parameters, leading eventually to history becoming a social science in India. The prehistory of the social sciences in India had begun in discussions around questions of the nature of Indian society and the cause of Indian poverty. Economists such as Dada Bhai Nauruji had maintained that the colonial economy had drained the wealth of India and that was the real source of Indian poverty. This raised heated controversies over the nature of the colonial economy and this again encouraged historian, historians to study pre-modern economies of India. Also at the same time, sorting out the strands of the caste structure and its social implications uh, became evident in the writings of sociologists such as D.P. Mukherjee and N.K. Bose, who were trying to unfreeze, as it were, this theoretical pattern of how caste society functioned. And discovering the reality of caste as it actually functioned led to recognizing how it differed from the ideal theoretical description in the Dharma Shastras. The conventional view tied Indian civilization to caste and religion as its enduring features and therefore refrained from questioning the social role of either. It was B. R. Ambedkar who, writing on the history of the Shudras and Dalits, projected his Dalit awareness back into history. 
and for him, the social hierarchy of caste was linked to issues of domination and subordination, which became central in his writing. But historians of the ancient period were hesitant to go beyond the normative texts and the conventional reading of caste died to religion continued. Among the more influential colonial views <clears throat> of world history was the division of the world into discrete monolithic civilizations. Each civilization was demarcated territorially and associated with a single language and a single religion. Indian civilization was defined as extending over the subcontinent with Sanskrit as its language and Hinduism as its religion. The lower castes and the forest peoples, the scheduled castes and tribes, were what the British referred to as the lesser breeds without the law. They were looked upon as primitive, and that is a label that still lingers at the popular level. Cultural nationalism, with its popular appeal, was molded by colonial readings of Indian civilization that were largely accepted by most Indians, as, sadly, they often continue to, do, to be. Few thought it necessary to investigate the complexities and multiple forms taken by pre-colonial culture. The simplistic definitions given by colonial scholarship were maintained. It was a category of nationalism that claimed to be concerned only with culture, but culture was defined largely in religious terms. Culture became the label for various diverse identities and their politics. Cultural nationalism, therefore, stayed close to the contours dictated by colonial interpretations. The claims frequently made today by groups to some particular identities being authentic, indigenous, unchanging, and eternal pose immense problems for historians. Identities, let us remember, are neither timeless and unchanging nor homogenous, nor singular, as maintained in the 19th century concept of civilization. In every society, historians have discovered, identities are multiple. A particular identity, be it an identity of religion, language, caste, ethnicity, or whatever, has relevance to particular situations and events. Historians cannot treat one identity as primary for all time, for all situations. Many parts of the world today, right across the globe, resonate with cultural nationalism of the kind I have described. This claims to draw on indigenous history, and it is often said that the new history is untouched by Western and European ideas. But the very process of constructing a history requires an awareness of earlier interpretations of history and the basis on which these were constructed. This is my justification for giving the kind of talk that I am giving. This makes us aware of how the present influences the readings of the past and the awareness required by historians to recognize this influence. The understanding of how nationalisms of various kinds are constructed has to include a critical inquiry into pre-modern history. The questioning of existing theories about the past began to be more distinctly formulated in the 1950s and the 1960s, at a time when other social sciences were also becoming prominent. This gradually altered the kinds of questions historians asked of their data. The range of sources slowly got widened. 
It also led to a distancing from colonial views and from those nationalist interpretations that were derived from the colonial, although there was appreciation of this earlier scholarship. But knowledge evolves and changes, and more so where a shift of paradigm is involved, where the frame of reference is being realigned. The validity of periodizing history as Hindu, Muslim, and British was increasingly doubted. It had assumed a history of 2,000 years of a golden age for the Hindu period, 800 years of despotic tyranny for the second, the Muslim period, and a supposed modernization under the British. Such divisions set aside the relevance of significant changes within these lengthy periods. That any age stretching over such a long time can be described as consistently glorious or tyrannical, either way, was questioned, and also the characterization of an age merely by the behavior of rulers or by their religion. These doubts were encouraged when history became more than just the study of dynasties. There was also the realization that communities and religions are not monolithic, but were and are segmented and fragmented into sects and groups. Each of these sects had varying relationships with the other, and it is these relationships which have to be analyzed. The history of religions ranging from social practice and ritual to belief and ideology is complex. It has to be correlated with the history of those who constitute its patrons and its lay followers. Alternate notions of periodization, different from the colonial Hindu, Muslim, British, were in part a reaction to the opening up of a dialogue between history and other disciplines. Conventional history had juxtaposed the succession of dynasties, one more glorious than the next, with the bare bones of an economic history, a social history, the history of religion, the history of art, the history of literature, and so on. These were all included within the same chronological brackets, but were not integrated. There was a vertical and almost exclusive view of each aspect, kept distinctly separate in standard histories. However, by relating these aspects more closely to each other and to a common historical context, they provided a network of interconnected features which enabled us to understand the history of a period much better. This gave greater depth and meaning to that understanding. The interface between the past and the present encouraged the notion that earlier historical experience could provide insights into some contemporary conditions. Historians also began to look at the way in which other disciplines studied aspects of society. This was particularly useful, for instance, in trying to reconstruct societies from archaeological data. This was no longer limited to just making a list of all the objects that were found in excavations. And added to this came the study of linguistics, the analyzing, the pulling apart of a language and seeing how it was constructed and what contributed to the construction of the language. Coinciding with these changes was the establishing of other disciplines within the social sciences, economics, sociology, anthropology, human geography, demography, and so on, with a much needed focus on Indian problems as particular and specific. Ancient history moved from being merely a part of Indology, which was a portmanteau label it applied to anybody that was doing studying any aspect of India, 
to becoming a social science and developing a new orientation of a different kind. There was the growing recognition that the past had to be explained, understood, reinterpreted on the basis of what historians began to refer to as a historical method based on critical inquiry. The reliability of the evidence and the logic of the argument continued to have the primacy that they had had earlier, but now there was a wider explanation of the historical context. The incorporation of evidence from archaeology and linguistics has been crucial in one controversy, for example, that has involved historians and many non-historians. This relates to the northwestern subcontinent in the third and second millennium BC. The controversy is over the identity of what, of what have been called the Aryans. The earlier theory of an Aryan invasion has been totally discounted and the scene is reconstructed differently. Mainstream historians maintain that there was contact and exchange between the settlements of the Northwest and the subcontinent and adjoining areas of Afghanistan and Central Asia in the second millennium BC. After the decline of the Harappan cities in about 1700 BC, there were small scale migrations of people speaking an Aryan language who settled and mingled with local societies. And evidence of this is found broadly in the area that is today known as the Oxus Valley in Central Asia, in northern, northeastern Iran, in northern Syria, and in northwestern India. There are some who would like to see the Harappans as the Aryans, so that the foundation of Indian civilization can be thought of as uniform, linear, going in a straight line back to the Aryans. And we may well ask, why is there this obsession with the Aryan? This was a 19th century notion. It was an obsession in Europe. Why do we carry on with this obsession in the 21st century in India? In the 19th century, the Aryans were seen as a race, an idea that is now totally discarded. Aryan is a language label and not a biological identity. Therefore, the linguistic evidence is extremely important. Indo-Aryan is a cognate, a sister language of other languages known from uh, Anatolia and Iran, and these all date to the middle of the second millennium BC, around 1500, 1400 BC. They are currently thought to be earlier in linguistic form than the Indo-Aryan of the Vedic corpus. Therefore, it is plausible that some of these people migrated into northwestern India. The archaeology of this period suggests settlements of pastoralists and cultivators and a familiarity with copper technology, iron technology coming much later. But opposed to this is the view that the Aryans are indigenous to India and that they were the authors of the Indus civilization for which view there is virtually no evidence. Such a reconstruction that the Aryans were indigenous to India is also a reincarnation of colonial notions about the Indian past. It was Colonel Olcott, uh, an American theosophist, and the theosophists in the 19th century who first argued that India was the homeland of a group of people whom they called the Aryans. It appealed to the upper caste Hindus who saw themselves as being the direct lineal descendants of these Aryans. And they also claimed a kinship connection with the British, a connection which is made by both Max Muller and Keshav Chandra Sen. There is even an echo of the theories of the very colorful Madame Blavatsky, 
that Aryan India was the cradle of world civilization and Indians traveled westwards, taking civilization with them. This kind of Aryan Indian identity, monolithic and uniform for all time, surfaces in some current political ideologies as well. My main contention is that since the evidence is so uncertain, the evidence changes each time there is an archaeological excavation, we can hold these theories, but please let's not battle over them. It is possible to explore the diverse dimension of social history from both the Vedic corpus and archaeology in more perceptive ways. In comparing archaeological and textual data, it is not enough to just compare lists of objects. It is necessary to examine the system of social functioning when trying to understand the cultures of these societies and their negotiations with each other. The roots of a civilization, Indian or any other, do not lie in a single identity, but in the multiple cultures that gave rise to the many societies of those and later periods. Examining how concepts and identities changed in history is basic to the study of cultural history. Other new ways of exploring the past brought about another kind of paradigm shift in historical writing. It involved using methods of analysis current in the social sciences. Historians in the 60s and 70s found themselves in dialogue with other social scientists, and this triggered off new directions in research. The challenge lay in history becoming an intellectual exploration as well as an understanding of the past. I would like to consider a few examples of the kind of historical themes that attracted histor historians of early India. These may illustrate the point that I am making. The concept of the nation had been foremost in the anti-colonial movement. We were about to become a nation. What did the nation mean? The question was, how far back can it be taken? And then gradually a differentiation had to be made between the nation or the nation state as a contemporary development and the state as something that went back to early centuries. Put at its simplest, a state refers to the forms of governance of a territory and the people living there, whereas the nation implies at least an awareness of a shared past by the people who constitute the nation, and this sharing of a, of a past is the investment in a shared future. For the pre-modern period, a centrally administered kingdom had been thought to be the norm for all states in all times. Everybody talked about kingdoms being highly centralized, their administration. And the argument went that when these kingdoms broke up, um, this was equated with political decline and was seen as the fragmentation of a polity accompanied by an absence of consolidated power. Empires were the order of the day, particularly with British historians who saw the British Empire as the successor, if not the reincarnation, of the great Roman Empire. The fashion caught on, and soon every important kingdom was labeled an empire. And even today, if you open many history books, you will read all about the Satavahana Empire, the Chalukya Empire, uh, the this empire, the that empire. The study of political forms and the likelihood of variation in patterns of power gradually led to demarcating varying forms of politics. For example, during the earliest period, a differentiation has to be made between clan-based societies with chiefs, 
now referred to as chiefships, and the more familiar form of kingship. The transition from clan-based polities to kingdoms is a seminal notion to the study of societies as described in the Vedic texts, the Mahabharata, and the Ramayana. These were all clan societies slowly changing to kingdoms. Similarly, the Ganasangha is described in the Buddhist Pali Canon. Chiefships being agro-pastoral are thought of as prior to kingship, which is based on plough agriculture. Kingdoms as state systems had a more complex administration with the focus of power all consolidated in one family. Historical analyses are, of course, complicated by the fact that these various forms do not move in a linear fashion, and they are not uniform in space and time. The questions being currently debated by historians relate to the social and economic reasons why and how societies change. The interfaces between the many cultures and the manner of legitimizing power. In many ways, these are questions that are still relevant. All these are questions germane to the wider inquiries into the Indian past. When the structure of the state began to be discussed, it led to a focus on how a state comes into existence. What, uh, what is state formation and what are the different types of states? The nature of the formation of states suggested variations. Thus, the Mauryan state of the 4th century BC was not identical with that of the Guptas who ruled uh, 800 years later in the 4th century AD. The nature of administration was again open to discussion. It can be asked whether the Mauryan Empire was a highly centralized bureaucratic system, as most of us have argued in our earlier writing, or can it be seen as a more diversified system, as some of us began to argue in our later writings. The tension between control from the center and the assertion of local autonomy has been a recurring feature and is now being commented upon. The regular use of the term empire for all kingdoms has come in for questioning, with kingdoms being differentiated from empire. Religion was an unlikely primary factor in the initial emergence of the state, since the state required more utilitarian resources. But in the welding of segments into an empire, as in the policies of Ashoka, the Mauryan ruler, or Akbar, the Mughal, there was recourse to certain facets of religion, among other things. And such facets need further analysis. Whereas previously, Brahmanism was the ideology that was discussed in detail, now alternate systems of thought are also eliciting greater interest. Arguments and counter-arguments among intellectuals of those times were part of the urban experience. They all gathered in parks on the edges of towns and held public debates, the kind of thing I wish we could do now. Earlier studies had noted that orthodox views were challenged by the heterodox, and these people were referred to by the Brahmins as the Nastika, the unbelievers, and the Pashanda, the frauds. The so-called heretics, in turn, used the same terms for the Brahmins when the debate became rather fierce. Such discussions, as for example the divergent views on social ethics, are not only significant in themselves, but also in the analysis of the text within a social context. Philosophical ideas are not merely part of a sectarian religious discourse. They are an integration, interrogation of knowledge, drawing on a spectrum of thought ranging from mysticism to logical rationality. From the colonial perspective, the primary economy of India was the agrarian economy. 
Com comparatively, less interest was shown in the study of urban cultures. That is now receiving considerable attention. Urbanization in the Ganges Plain in the 6th centuries BC was linked to the emergence of state systems with attendant changes in, in, in technology and administration. The currently debated question is what was the role of iron technology in the process of urbanization? Which is a very different question from what was asked 50 years ago. The investigation of the state as a process has focused on its location in terms of environment, resources, and demography, as well as its potential as a center for the exchange of goods and the hub of administration. This was partially influenced by the focused research on the much earlier Harappan cities. Exchange in varying forms from barter to commerce for, for which there is a spurt of evidence in the post maurian period, 200 BC to 300 AD, provided an additional economic dimension. The study of coins as part of the economy introduced the first notions of looking at money and markets as exchange centers. Uh, a study of market centers in South India, for example, raises the question of whether commerce could have been an economic factor in the emergence of kingdoms amongst the Cheras, the Cholas, and the Pandyas. And this suggests a variant pattern. Closeness to other parts of Asia was known through overland routes. Maritime connections have now come to the forefront, underlining new cultural and intellectual intersections. The perspective on the Indian past, earlier viewed from the Himalaya and the Hindu Kush mountains of the north, is now being extended to include the very different perspective from the Indian Ocean to the south. Increasing evidence of maritime connections has also raised questions linked to complex commercial arrangements. In the period just prior to the European arrival in Asia, the commercial orbit of Afro-Asian trade ran from Tunis in North Africa to Canton in South China. There was a route that linked these places. The commerce crossed state boundaries and involved elements of what we today would call international trade and investments. Therefore, half-serious comments are being made by historians on globalization before globalization. But more seriously, this does question the validity of treating civilizations as autonomous and segregated and isolated, and instead recognizing them to be porous and interconnected. Historians in many parts of the world have discussed, and this is a new area of considerable interest in history, have discussed and continue to do so the theories that explain and interpret historical events. In India, there has been, since the middle of the 20th century, an interest in the writings of Karl Marx, Max Weber, and the French sociologists and historians of the Annals School, since all of them had written on India. For Karl Marx and Max Weber, India was the immensely different other of Europe. Each provided alternate explanations for why India was thus completely different. And not only India, but they very often included Asia. Historians debated these explanations and are still doing so. And in the process, aspects of the past that had earlier seemed closed were becoming visible. And the discussion brought what were thought to be peripheral subjects, marginal subjects, right into the center of historical concerns. The centrality of social and economic history was evident in all these theories of explanations. This was a change from dynastic history. 
Marxist historical writing introduced the idea of what was called modes of production. Marx's notion of the Asiatic mode of production, which was a kind of variant of Oriental despotism, was rejected by Indian Marxists. So too was the slave mode of production. This had been based on studies of ancient Greece and Rome, and comparison with evidence from India was attempted, but the model was found to be unsuitable. However, the possibility of a feudal mode of production captured the attention of Indian historians. The notion of feudalism had initially drawn on European parallels, but now the discussion centered on the Marxist model. It is interesting that the critique of this feudal mode of production for India was also initiated by Marxist scholars. The argument was based on changes in land relations in the latter half of the first millennium AD uh, in India. The transition to feudalism, it was argued, lay in the system of granting land or villages primarily to Brahmins, to temples, to Buddhist monasteries, and to a few who served the state. Since the granting of land became a focal point of the political economy, the parallel, as it were, to feudal holdings uh, in Europe, since the, uh, it brought about a tangible change. This became central after about the 8th, 9th centuries AD, which makes it a time marker for a new periodization. The discussion for and against the feudal mode opened up new perceptions about the nature of the state, the economy, and society. Religious activities, as well as the more down-to-earth factors that determine agrarian systems, were also considered. And it also led to non-Marxist theories of state formation. Religious beneficiaries under this land-grant system uh, established institutions and became extremely powerful property holders, as in the case of the Buddhist and Jain monasteries and the Brahmanical mutts. And later on, of course, you had the same tradition continuing with the Sufi khankas. Some religious sects that began as small local cults with a regional base, when their popularity increased and they received royal patronage, became a network of support for a particular dynasty. This process was to be common and visible in many regions of India. The Yadavas, for instance, in the Deccan, were both devotees and patrons of the emerging cult of Vithala, a form of Vishnu, widely worshipped in Maharashtra and parts of Karnataka, and also very well known here in Goa. This is thought to have had its origins in the hero cult of local pastoralists. Royal patronage of a popular religious cult meant that the geographical distribution of the cult could become the area of support for the patron and the overlap of religion and politics in that process becomes evident. Activities covered by the all-inclusive label of religion have often to be analyzed uh, as social institutions in order to understand their function in a community. Religious organizations are not just religious organizations, they also play a social role. This helps to clarify the links between social roles and religious beliefs. Religious establishments, whether Buddhist, Jain, Vaishnav, or Shaiv, quite apart from their role in fostering formal religion, were sometimes channels of political intervention through their relationship with rulers. The patronage of kings can go from one sect to another, from the succession of one king to the next. Historians are sometimes left guessing 
as to the king's religious affiliation, although in most cases this is made clear. At the same time, popular religious movements, some known to deviate from or even contradict the orthodox, such as the Shakta and the Tantric sects in their early stages, occupied a prominent place on a wider social canvas. The many manifestations of what have been called the devotional religion or bhakti or the Shakta sects take varying social forms differing from one region to another. The variations provide insights into local connections and histories. Max Weber's idea of legitimacy as being essential to political authority is receiving increasing attention. Rituals, apart from their religious function, can also be statements of legitimacy and therefore a source of power. Historical traditions are sometimes created to satisfy the need for legitimation. Priests perform rituals to endow their patrons with status and with the promise of success. The patron acquires prestige and the priest receives material wealth as a fee or a gift, the dakshina. Such relationships based on what is called gift giving are not just demonstrations of generosity. They are, in effect, bonds of another kind between the donor and the recipient. Studies in the patterns of genealogies and lineages, as recorded in the epics and later in the inscriptions, are providing new insights into early societies. The lengthy lists of heroes and anti-heroes in various texts are being examined for new information, especially on a variety of social observances. For, in for instance, one is intrigued, uh, repeatedly intrigued in fact, by the polyandrous marriage of Draupadi in the Mahabharat. This raises many questions as to why there should have been this intense deviation from the normal rules. Caste, as studied by social anthropologists, has encouraged historians to ask similar questions, but from their entirely different sources. What was earlier thought to be the unchanging character of caste has given way to realizing that degrees of social mobility were possible, but not widely so, and involved imitating the lifestyle of the upper castes. This appears to be more apparent in what is referred to in the Purans as kings creating new kshatriyas. Politics was an open arena as it still continues to be, and claims to Kshatriya status as part of legitimation are frequent. The process was not always one of gentle osmosis, imitating upper caste lifestyles or being incorporated into the upper castes or contesting upper castes can be sometimes the cause of friction if not aggression as happens even today. The work on gender history has not been limited to just accumulating more data on the history of women as in the past. It is now concerned with re-examining the position of women from various strata of society and social relationships. It is also searching for the perspective that women had of themselves in their society a question that is seldom asked. For example, it was earlier stated that all women were held in high respect in ancient India. The evidence invariably quoted was that of the woman philosopher Gargi asking tough philosophical questions. But this evidence sits uncomfortably alongside references in the same texts to the substantial numbers of women domestic slaves, the Dasis, and these were women who were gifted as wealth, as is clear from the Rig Veda and the Mahabharat. They were regarded as chattel and as property. 
The Buddhist texts have statements about women complaining of their distinctly subordinate position. In the legal forms of marriage, in the Manu Shastra, for example, the woman becomes an object. She is either gifted, as in Kanyadana, or she is abducted, as in the Rakshas form, the form which is resorted to by Arjun in the Mahabharata. The historian's concern is to place these statements in the context of the particular societies where they occur and thereby to try and understand the nature of that society. One of the important avenues of change was when clans mutated, got transformed into castes. This was a continuous and constant process in various parts of the subcontinent. The change was not simultaneous and old forms sometimes remained as a parallel stream. But the origins of certain other castes can also be traced to non-caste groups who had previously had clan or occupational identities, such as forest dwellers or certain kinds of artisans. The cultural assimilation of, of clans often resulted in the chief's families becoming the, taking on kshatriya status and the rest of the clan being regarded as shudras and being, uh, becoming the peasants. A picture of this process can be glimpsed in the Harsha Charita of Bana Bhatta, a 7th century biography of King Harsha Vardhana of Kanauj. This social change required the converting of forest into fields and an erstwhile more egalitarian society having to accept the hierarchies of caste. And then a permanent supply of labor was ensured by using the caste structure and declaring that some groups and some occupations were so low and polluting as to make such people permanently untouchable. The explanations for this theory provide another dimension of social history. Historical explanations are now being extended to include a slow but growing interest in the landscape where events take place. What were the environmental factors, if any, in a changing situation? Thus, the decline of the Harappan cities is now more often explained by environmental factors, such as changing river courses or the desiccation of the area than by invasions. Environmental factors leading to the migration of people, which, if you argue there was a migration of Harappans to the outlying areas, raises all kinds of interesting historical questions as to what was the impact of this migration. The history of deforestation and how it changed the landscape and climate in many areas of the subcontinent over many centuries needs detailed study. Investigation of environmental factors has tended to highlight the history of the region where the change occurs. This brings one into the question of regional history. The interest in regional history grew by degrees, assisted to some extent by the creation of linguistic states from the late 1950s, superseding the more arbitrary boundaries of the erstwhile provinces of British India. The perspective of subcontinental history, conveniently viewed from the Ganges plain, has had to change with the evidence now coming from various regional histories. For example, the history of South India is rightly much more prominent in general histories of India than it was 50 years ago. Regional histories form patterns that sometimes differ from each other. The variations provide interesting facets for the study of comparative history. For example, the model of the four varnas, the four castes, was not the caste pattern in the entire subcontinent 
as was maintained earlier. We still have to explain why Brahmins and Velala peasants gave shape to the history of Tamil Nadu, as many historians think, whereas Khatri traders dominated in the north, in the Punjab. Differences such as these are not just diversities in regional styles. They are expressions of multiple cultural norms that cut across the assumption that all identities are and have always been monolithic and uniform. The reorientations that I have mentioned were anticipated as a consequence of interdisciplinary trends and of method methodological change and discussions of the theories of explanation. Alongside this, there developed an interest in investigating how historians write history and where the intellectual influences on them may lie. This is encouraging the investigation of the history of ideas. One hopes that the early systems of thought and what are sometimes called proto-science and proto-philosophy will be explored, adding a further dimension to history by examining their impact on historical change. Let me now conclude by saying that if historical knowledge is to be meaningful, then the past has to be understood and explained. It is not enough just to get information from a source, whether it is an archaeological artifact or a text. It also has to be interpreted. This requires assessing the reliability of the evidence to begin with, and then asking a number of questions about its authorship, function, audience, and significance. This is particularly called for in the study of ancient history, since its very remoteness in time makes it somewhat difficult to grasp. There can be a thin line between what we like to believe happened and what the evidence is actually telling us. Historical knowledge, like all knowledge, is continually growing and changing, and this helps us to test our generalizations and clarify our understanding of the past. And questioning existing knowledge can help in delving deeper into possible explanations, and explaining the past justifies, it seems to me, the pursuit of history. Thank you.